In life, it's often stated that time is an indelibly precious resource. In cartoons, it's basically priceless. There are very few of us that would willingly throw away any more of it than we have to. It applies all across the board, but no better is it exemplified than within the Hollywood structure. On the creative side, it's no secret that it can take years to incubate any concept and craft it into a real story, whether they're aspiring for greatness or not. Yet, once they're thrust into the corporate system, a deficit of time, along with other various factors, will ultimately make or break how the story is seen by the world. This is the through line for how the American animation industry conducts business. It's easy enough to apply these scenarios to movies, but if you think about it, this is just another Tuesday for cartoon crews, especially the ones in TV animation. Concepts that people can carry with them for years or even decades are punched up and thrown around the pipeline only to the extent of how forgiving their production timeline really is. Sometimes the structure's been noted to help series come along, incentivizing the creatives involved to think on their feet and be quick on the draw. Literally. Other times it's been noted to leave many important people and creators in the dust, whether through the looming threat of creative stagnation or through raw crunch alone. It's an important aspect of production and not necessarily the most important. Obviously, there's plenty of franchises and legendary worlds spawned from a very quick pitch. Even the shortest runs can have an extremely profound effect on a wide dearth of individuals. What is the shortest cartoon you can think of? In length, in episode count, in production cycle, there'd be plenty of candidates to choose from. In many contexts, a brief run can be considered an undeserved death sentence, but others have flourished despite a short cycle of airtime. As far as I can tell, the shortest run in a while belongs to that of a Disney cartoon of all things. A super conglomerate that can spoil the shit out of successful projects left this one in the dust not too long ago. With how far it stayed under the radar, it gives a whole new meaning to the phrase underground production. Billy Dilly's Super Duper Subterranean Summer is a 2017 Disney XD original animated series created by Aaron Springer. Aaron Springer is a cartoon genius. Presumably it was an older concept with its existence being revealed in 2014 when XD scooped Springer up in an overall deal. Two years later, an official series Greenlight was announced along with future DTVA hit Big City Greens. By the summer of 2017, XD heralded its arrival by dropping a new half hour every day until they ran out of episodes. That left us with a grand total of 13 episodes. They started on a Saturday and ended it the Thursday after next. Not even a full two weeks in premieres. Now to be entirely fair, they did a decent job playing Hype Man before it officially dropped. Each new episode that came out aired like six times a day, each and every time. But after its conclusion, there was radio silence. Aside for some brief periods of reruns, the only other time the series was acknowledged was due to its arrival on Disney+. Plus. It was the last original Disney XD cartoon to come up, and we know basically nothing about it. I watched every single episode several times when it came out, but even I couldn't really even talk about it after so long. With so few episodes behind it, it seemed like a good opportunity to go through everything and really unpack it. But now it's been like five years since the show's come out, so I, I think we're overdue for a deep dive of sorts. Episode by episode, scene to scene, beat for beat. The longer we spend not digging in, is more time we spend burning daylight. It's hard to do when you're buried deep underground, but still, we're going all in here. The first two minutes or so are a pretty succinct exposition dump of how the main trio were assembled and it explains their initial circumstances well enough, but the lead into the theme song actually gives the full experience of the concept itself. It's emphasized that these three are here by way of pure luck, not exactly begging to be unshackled, but not there of their own volition either. So when they plunge into the middle of subterranean Tania, the overgrown jungle expanse in the core of the Earth, we'd expect them to be in a full-on panic. This is not actually the case. They made it clear that they all have their own obligations they're going to be missing out on, but they acclimate to the reality of being stuck pretty well. 
As a way of thrusting us into the same state of mind, our three heroes are flung into the eyeline of these lizard people called the Gorks and their surly king. As flighty and distractible as Billy is, it was clear that he was not his own worst enemy, at least not in this segment. His offhand knowledge of an extant species' mating patterns actually allowed them to scrape by the skin of their teeth in the end. I like that it wasn't particularly overt either. Any other establishing story would likely play up the presumed uselessness of the fact at hand and the lack of interest in such a concept. You know, it doesn't feel like they're just tolerating him, which probably isn't the first impression you'd glean from such a setup. The second segment had a much bigger challenge in that area. Determined to get back to base after a spontaneous kidnapping by Pterosaur, two of Billy's cohorts, Zeke and Marsha, are left with the additional goal of getting back without Billy's fanaticism for a children's TV show host enabling their premature extinction. This is definitely more liable to test your patience if you weren't sure about this setup. It definitely makes sense for him to be attached to one of the few connections he has left in the surface world, of course. The fact that it took him a while to fully prioritize his science buddies would Give one pause, especially at this point in time. I mean, it makes sense, given how sudden their initial partnership was, but not everyone would be down with that. By the end of their trek, it's clear Billy's not the only one seeking those familiar comforts. By the tail end, they have a new dwelling built, powered by the well power imbued by a reserve of prime junk food. Atmospherically speaking, the first half hour feels like a, a really strong pitch, based on what I observed the first segment had given a decent setup set the pace well and made use of some spirited movement arcs. I found that the music was a bit overstated, but it did a great job of giving us that right amount of eclectic. The show really does seem like it's made a ride off of unconventional interest. It's a really strong intro to the show and one that I can't see many people having an issue getting through. This pair is focused on immersing you in the world, though admittedly not entirely through hard world building. They start stacking the surface dwelling trio with traits and attributes that laid them more in the literal underworld, like cooking. The calzone struggle is kind of felt. You can't hype up a man this heavy and then abandon his Michelin star tier work two minutes later. Zeke's freak out is, is kind of justified here. What can I say? This would normally provide an opportunity to play off a lot of simple gags and everything, but they actually gave this man a small arc. The emotionality of the Calzones arc, while not too directly relatable, is a quick way to suck you into the story. Even if by the tail end it's disregarded, we got to go on a well-rounded trip with these guys that felt like time well spent. The second segment is more of a day in the life saga than you'd expect. It was a dead giveaway from the jump that Billy was more comfortable in the stew environment, but he's now apparently comfortable enough to become part of it. Inspired by the emergent wildlife, he decides to swap out his human hands with some crab pincers. He's enamored enough with his new claws, but by the time he gets home, he swapped out most of his limbs with the parts of other subterranean inhabitants. Sid from Toy Story was apparently ahead of his time. Once it's made evident that the new additions he added on were oxymoronic to their branding, the animals Billy appropriated his parts from confront him on the tip of a volcano to get their shit back, ironically convincing him that his standard human parts were improvements on their own primitive assets. That moment in the Batcave is begging to be put on Twitter without context. The irony of this transparent rant bait being placed in the episode that's supposed to immerse you in the ethos of this world is not lost on me. These two did a good job of keeping the bar set high. Having narrowly established the timeline and workings of this setup, these set the stage for the rest of the season to be a sitcom if it wanted to. A character comedy with real heft from how it interacts with the kooky world outdoors gives you a lot to play with visually. So while I doubt we're gonna get to know everything about everything, Whichever characters are held in high regard are probably going to be a treat to watch. In an experience evocative of Cinderella stuck in backwater Mississippi, the boys decide to politely catfish Marsha in order to ease her tenuously established FOMO about a missed date. They go through the whole night as if it was real, which is unconventional, but sticking out until the end at least stacks up to a decent conclusion. They used a chunk of the song from the end credits for the chase sequence, which I appreciated even if it wasn't 100% on point for the moment. 
The way Billy literally pawns himself off like a piece of wagyu is pretty admirable, though later on you probably feel a moment like this could have been used in other more pressing scenarios. The secondaries from the previous story are pretty much plot devices for the main through line to play out smoothly. Here the episode abides by rules closer to the reverse. The tourney subplot between Zeke and the Trogis are pretty entertaining. It's wild that these Crow magnon were able to cheat past him so effortlessly, but it led to good old classic cartoon face-off hijinks that are earnestly very fascinating. These are a pack of grade-A savages right here. So far, everything or everyone that's supposed to bounce off these three seem kind of ancillary to our comprehension of understanding this world. There's going to be other episodes that introduce the real supporting characters, though the way this pair handled the device's setup can mirror the general importance lent to whichever other beings fell out the world. A lot of these feel like shorts more than regular stories. It's a way of easing you in without leaving you high and dry, which I think works. Someone who's more invested in character comedy might start to feel this drag, but pretty soon thereafter, the true cast of Billy Dilly starts to leap out at you and develop. In this episode, we're introduced to these Firefly-type creatures that somehow are to help Marsha rebound from a loss in journalistic games. They gave her the poop and the scoop. It's so spicy, she chose not to publish its contents out of good faith. The rest of the runtime is occupied with the average story about person A trying the one person B's secret, leading to them eventually tumbling into B's way of teaching them a lesson. This is the first instance of a more egotistical Billy to date, seemingly entitled to be imbued with all the land secrets by measure of curiosity alone. The episode ends on a typical note, but the source of the scoop is what's occupying my energy right now. I mean, they had to be dragged far outside the bounds of home base to get to these woozies in the first place. How well do they get around? It seems vast, but not endless. I choose to focus on all these shots in the mushroom swamp. They look beautiful. In contrast to the last segment, which is more window dressing for more character focus, this one is another concerning Billy being thrown in the midst of the landscape's fringe dangers. Initially, I was wondering if having to contend with every instance of Count Wretched being driven astray by Billy would start to grate on me at some point. Like if this were 2012, the SpongeBob fan forums would be tearing this shit up. Though after a final watch, I think I understand that this story has a much larger scope than you would initially assume. What stops it from overstepping its boundaries would be the fact that Retcher is more transparently miserable and willing to stick his own foot in his mouth than most others. He has a shit life, but he mainly brings the wrath of Billy onto himself. For one, it's probably the least torturous or insufferable out of the segments. If you're one to bend to the whim of Squidward torture porn, as the kids would call it, this is your warning to make it out while you still can. It not only gives you a wider berth of settings and characters to think about, but it willingly exemplifies how far Billy's willing to go in the pursuit of science and mechanical inquiry. So far, so good. There is a decent character comedy on both ends, but also a good chunk of world building. Honestly, any chance to see these characters cavort around this giant backdrop is more than enough for me. The characterization of Billy himself helps these hijinks feel self-contained and not too all-consuming, at least not yet. Wondering how they'll keep introducing him to other characters in this universe. This episode is ridiculous by default. If there is any argument to be made against this show or this character, this is uh, the prime evidence that you will have to dissect. Both halves of this one is supposed to give you a balanced sense of Billy Dilly, which manifests here as two extreme portrayals and two parallel scenarios. I'm not against this automatically, it's often the most outlandish of character exercises that produce comedically cogent content. Though I think the circumstances of this story in particular are a lot to take at face value. Billy ends up befriending this swamp creature girl by pure luck. His mind is always absorbed by ecological queries rather than actual sustaining relationships. Now this girl named Judy is interested in him as a person. But perhaps out of patience or endless oblivion, his lack of genuine connection is only underscored when he gives a random earthworm the same attention that she was going to reciprocate. He has a strange-ass love affair with this worm, neglecting the main person who actually want to engage with him on a deeper level. 
and his infatuation sends him into the spiral. After a few days, he reemerges, looking like dog shit, visually and emotionally. And at the last minute or so, he's in the midst of brushing Judy off again, but he has an abrupt, loosely established heel turn. He lets his attachment to the worm go and starts to express some interest in befriending the swamp creature, only for her to rebuff him in the end, which honestly squad goals. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. It's no secret that this character is not exactly world-weary or invested in the most important things. Balancing that is definitely in the spirit of the show, it's kind of the whole point, but the extent to which the writers chose to drag this one out didn't carry as much weight as it could have, or at least maybe didn't distribute it in the right areas. I mean, compared to everything else, it seems like this, this kid's finally lost his damn mind. I wouldn't mind so much if this wasn't this character's only chance to shine. I am, I'm breaking the progressive structure of this review to tell you that they straight up did not utilize her. Like, at all. Outside of a couple more crowd shots, Judy is nowhere to be found for the rest of the show. To give you the benefit of a doubt, uh, it has been rumored that the show initially had 20 episodes or so hacked down to about 13. And so even if that's that's not true, I thought it was important to bring up in order to play devil's advocate here. I assume it's likely that she would have featured in at least a couple more episodes under that original order. And if we can roll with the implication that her recurrence within was a sacrificial lamb for the rest of the show to stay intact, then, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a pretty poor sacrifice. I'm not even gonna front. It just doesn't, doesn't work super well here. I'm sorry. It's more of a cynical, selfish slant to this character that's not offset by the plot or the stakes or anything. I want to see more, but only because we, we weren't given enough to walk away with in the first place. In Reciprocal, this segment's focus is on establishing the dynamics that fill out the cast, along with the various bits and details that determine how the world is characterized. It's a bit all over the place, but you're given a lot to work with. Billy is actually functioning more as a bystander than he would in other episodes. We're in that phase where we're just getting gaps of air from the universe through his lens. Instead of retreating into his own whimsical misadventures and odious haberdashery, we are thrust balls deep into the interpersonal struggles of some magically endowed codgers. It's one of those love potion joints gone wrong mixed with a lot of other goofy stuff. Now, I'm not gonna front, I, I wasn't in love with either of these, but I think they served an important function in showing just how far the title character can go. Sometimes the spectacle is just truly a spectacle, and it might not feel like it really serves a purpose, but these episodes are going to be serving as an important bar to see how Billy's characterization swings in other episodes. After stealing a wayward slab from a rock pillar forest, Marcia is convinced that Billy is slowly turning into a beast. He's not too keen on returning what he took, so she follows him around, slowly seeing his symptoms manifest. It's perfectly serviceable, but for a Marsha episode, it's a bit understated. Her acting in this one was half of what made it work, so it was good to see that flexed. I'm not entirely sure what the grand plan would be to give her more development. This doesn't feel beneath her or anything, but it doesn't feel like enough either. Personally, if any of the three had more episodes about their connections to the surface world, I wouldn't mind. Not necessarily for any grounded elements, just for a change of pace. Sitcom-style bullshit is fun, but it has a tendency to just blend in with each other. Meanwhile, Billy finds a wounded stranger on the side of the road and brings him home. But as a professional con man, he does nothing but steals their house. Zartran is definitely one of the most outspoken inhabitants of this whole terrain. You could carry a scene without breaking a sweat, and seeing the hyperdramatics accented by his victim's suffering is it, it, just nuts. It's merely a flex on Springer's design philosophy and Travis Willingham's flourish for voice acting. If you think about it, these two are, are really just uh, strong representations of what the voice cast can do. It really does remind you how, how much of a bone they threw us. Even for a show as visually driven as this one, sometimes the mic is mightier than the sword. And it really does come out in episodes like these. So in this episode, Marsha suddenly becomes 
extremely klutzy due to a bug bite, and it's up to Billy to try and fix her. Or at least keep her away from whatever he's doing. Obviously, this is a premise just ripe for extra physical comedy, and I was definitely drawn to the type that they were putting in this episode. Like, it was entirely pointless. Like, the whole story <laughs> uh, ended up being pointless. But for this show, the idea of minimal stakes usually leads to more chaos than not, which is a net good for everybody. In fact, the next episode takes full advantage of that by plunging Steve-O into subterranean Tania and just having him goof off with Zeke and Billy. No, I'm not even kidding. Like, this is, this is literally Steve-O. They have just integrated Steve-O of Jackass into the canonical universe of Billy Dilly. It's fucking awesome. It's no flex on hard action elements, but a good spirit is there. It's weird that this one is such a character piece, but certainly not unwelcome. I mean, anytime this show chooses to expand on its secondaries, it pretty much does not strike out, except that one time. We don't talk about that. There's something to be said for Steve-O just embracing all of Billy's weird scientific pursuits. It's clear where the conflict is supposed to lie, but between the three of them, the dynamic ain't super pushy either. I'm wondering what more adventures would have been had with just the three of them. That'd make a good miniseries for Disney+, Plus, wouldn't it? This pair of episodes felt a bit more competent, because they were primarily just hijinks that had a good edge and managed to keep everything grounded. It's weird to say, but they didn't get too eccentric with either, which ironically I think helped with the more expressive posing and in general just embellished all of those kookier elements. This would probably be a good place to take a small break and talk more about the history behind this show. You probably already know the basics, which would likely include who made it. While his work on Spongebob perhaps serves as his most weighty credit, Springer's creative excellence stretches far beyond the reaches of the atoll. Throughout the 2000s, he actually got a few ideas to the pilot stage. Korgoth of Barbaria, which also shares a premiere date with Billy, is likely the most well-known and most successful of the lot. If not for its high production costs, its popularity would have likely carried it straight to a season pickup. The Periwinkle Shorts, a silent comedy featuring a traveling platypus man, was a softer edition exhibited within the short-lived Sunday Pants anthology in Cars Network, and presumably nowhere else. The third concept, titled Blue Balloon's Fun Park, is definitely closest in tone and style to the eventual Billy Dilly concept. Centered around an eccentric amusement park owner and his two stooge employees trying to keep everything open, it is by far the most obscure of the trio, and by extension, the least celebrated. Peeking at some of the concept art, it's definitely evocative of those past works. The easiest inspiration to cite for most people would probably be that of Schoolhouse Rock with the blockier caricatures that would have sprouted from this idea. My first impression of it took me back to the Richard Scarry books, which happen to be one of Springer's main inspirations in terms of general design philosophy. In any event, it seems like Billy Dilly had an uphill battle from the jump. It's no secret that Disney XD's been trifling with a nasty case of mistaken identity for a while. Its slightly longer development timeline would have made it susceptible to not only the rotating rogues gallery of executives that would have had to oversee it, but also to the shifting scheduling priorities of the channel. Something to be noted is that each of the Disney XD cartoons debuted as part of a pair. It's immediately obvious because the way one would completely curb stomp the other in popularity was quite blinding. Randy Cunningham, Ninth Grade Ninja was released a couple months behind Gravity Falls. Motor City and Tron Uprising were released within weeks of Gravity Falls' launch. Wander Over Yonder and the 7D are a bit more segregated, but they were released within a year of each other. Milo Murphy's Law got to trail Future Worm by two months. Pickle and Peanut and Two More Eggs were dropped within a month of each other. Star vs. and Pen Zero Part-Time Hero function basically the same way. Kick Batowski premiered three years after Phineas and Ferb, but it was an active part of the marketing to consider it a sister series of sorts. So there's that. Billy actually got to premiere first out of its pairing about two months, but guess what was following it up? Ah! 
Yeah, its brief two-week stretch was barely a blip on the radar compared to the absolute duck extravaganza that touched down in late 2017. And none of that even begins to account for how any of them were scheduled. It's telling that most of their cartoons are considered screwed over in some capacity or context. Even the ones that had full support like Milo and Star definitely got their asses handed to them in later seasons. I can't exactly pinpoint any of them with a perfect release schedule, except maybe Gravity Falls, because that was definitely more of Alex's problem than the networks, but I digress. But knowing what you do at this point in the video, I doubt most of you would try and dispute that Billy's treatment by Disney XD was nothing short of ludicrous. <laughs> Jumping back into the latter half of this show, this extra context may or may not alter your perception of what's going on. In a concrete sense, we got to explore how some important concepts meld together into more tangible makings. These final six half hours were assigned more abstract interpretive aspects to exhibit, and I suppose that wasn't by design, but in hindsight, it would make sense to try and look under the hood after establishing all this surface level information that was present throughout. Whether or not it can hold itself up and be sustainable would likely be proven here, if anything. So this is the second appearance of Zartran, and definitely my favorite out of the two. They, they made the most of it, for sure. Me and Billy walked themselves into a sting operation for the chance to score some pie. That's an oversimplification, but that's essentially what happens. The effort uh, to get Billy to jump through all these hoops to please this undercover grandma cop uh, really gave them an opportunity to just pummel Zartran into the dirt for the whole episode. I don't consider it unremarkable, but because it is pretty conventional, it's, it's hard to say what I like about it. This is one of the few I remember liking from the jump, likely because in a structural sense it wasn't all over the place. They could have fun with its premise and still keep things different. Billy himself seemed to edge into being dumb, much more than just being extremely naive, but that doesn't really affect the course or the tone of the story, which was a welcome addition. It was a bit of a breather, even if he nearly gave himself a kill count. Meanwhile, Billy becomes enamored by this wart on one of the chimpies, and he steals it to his new friend's abject horror. Everything is a bit more drawn out than it would normally be, and uh, it's just one of those times where Billy is not acting very pod. Yeah, Billy! Yucky! Uh-huh. Yeah, Billy! Yucky! Uh-huh. It's clear that uh, all the bullshit going on is done for entertainment. I think your mileage is going to vary heavily at this point. This is one of those times that reminds me that uh, Springer was in charge of just as many bad Spongebob episodes as he was good. And I mean, the presentation wasn't god-awful or anything, but it is one of those really polarizing presentations of Billy. It's close enough to Hey Judy that I had to, I had to consider their similarities for a minute. This one was definitely more enjoyable, though. Paired up with the previous episode, it likely would be a trippy watch. I feel like these work better as a pair because they do kind of balance each other out. Just general character shit aside, the first half was griffing me harder than the second, but consuming them at the same time makes watching both of them a better experience. gets bullied in the woods somewhere, pushing him to want to change his hairdo. To afford the wig that he's looking for, he abuses some mammoths and goofs off before a pet show. On paper, it should feel like one that I would dislike, but 
Honestly, a, a lot of the initial distaste that you might have for it, it was, I'm kind of numb to it at this point. I'm mostly stuck on the new characters they introduced for this one. I like how varied the mammoths look, along with these Gork-style greasers. There's a bit more going on to distract from Billy fucking up at every single turn, and the weight of his antics aren't as prominent. Back in the day, this would have been <laughs> this would have been torched if it were a SpongeBob episode. Not even front. Meanwhile, while house sitting for the Hagwitch, Billy ends up getting into some wacky hijinks with a couple of his buddies and some magical merchandise that is stuck in her dresser. I've watched it a couple times and I don't remember much of it. It follows the same pretense as stories like The Date or Billy Willie. It's fine, though the designs for the mutations were crazy to look at. It's probably the most memorable part of the joint. So neither of these were as emotionally attention-grabbing as the other more kooky stories, but they're inoffensive based on how they played out. The episodic nature of this series is supposed to cement their summer underground as some kind of mirror of what they do or how they'd be on the surface. I don't think anyone in the trio, not even a Naximander, has been itching to leave unless it was convenient for the plot. They're not super enchanted with the accommodations, but the way they do conform to all of Retro's sabotage is quick-witted. It's interesting to see, especially for characters I wouldn't say have had a strong motivation to do much in terms of the surface world. It's interesting that Retro is probably, at this point, one of the most fleshed out and sympathetic characters of this whole outfit. I mean, the arrival of the surface dwellers didn't tank his life or anything, but it probably must have felt that way. They live so casually. <laughs> When they're so far away from home, it's like they don't even give a shit. And with another life just a short ride up there, there should be nothing stopping him from being able to break free from his own life. It would probably mean more to him. His life is like no modern tragedy, but he's probably the only one in subterranean Tania that has a motivation of such caliber. And it's an interesting note to think about like two-thirds of the way through. Meanwhile, Jared's just a... Just a mildly humorous episode. Probably one closer to Billy Willy where shit just happens and suddenly stops. But it's a slightly more tolerable Billy character study than some of the other ones we've gotten so far. He ends up taking in some random bow-legged owl demon named Jared. He gets jealous when he starts to make friends with everybody else in the house. It's so random, but uh, it low-key feels like uh, they had to plan around this sort of episode. If you didn't already know, Disney XD was airing another cartoon at the same time called Future Worm, and Jared here would happen to share a voice with one of the main characters. And it's it's kind of distracting, not gonna front. I know I'm one of the four collective people that sat through all of Future Worm 2, but um, this was weird. This, this was a weird watch. Billy's not as fast-moving or action-slanted as Future Worm was, but that 40-second chase sequence was fucking hilarious. Out of the second half of the series, these are definitely at the top of my personal list. After being brushed off by his pet rat on the wrong day at the wrong time, Billy moves to replace him with a giant slug who gives him a taste of his own medicine by being too damn clingy. This one said more about how one would see Billy than anything else. For many people, an Axemander would probably be a valid surrogate for how they feel as a member of the audience, but how Billy chooses to deal with his slug problem is actually kind of tame. The amount of copium he was chugging when this slug actually went back to being a slug is, is immense, though. It was kind of funny to see. Meanwhile, Zeke comes into contact with some poison shrub, or so he says, and Billy has to quarantine him in a giant bubble. Not the best episode to watch in current year, but I'll take it. I've been trying to not draw a constant comparison to SpongeBob, but I, I, I can't even fake. I'm sorry. It doesn't even have that much hinging on it being super different. So it sticks out all the more when it kind of looks parallel. Anyway, these were more or less business as usual. You're probably used to the formula by now.
So after mysteriously losing one of the Gorg's most prized cultural artifacts, Billy takes it upon himself to find the culprit at no personal expense whatsoever. This one is fairly roundabout, but it wraps up in a satisfying way at least. To me, it's structurally better than other episodes that are just okay, but it blends in like the rest of them. Meanwhile, Anaximander starts shedding unexpectedly, so the gang try and cheer him up with the power of music. This one's just an excuse to put the fun first in a way the rest of us can hop on board for it easily. For what it's worth, the second half is probably my favorite of the entire show. In ways that can't be foreshadowed, it does feel sincere to what the show is supposed to be at its core. It's simple, it's fun, it leaves the door open for all sorts of new designs to lead through it. it. It's just cool. Only the next and final half hour really matches that level of spectacle. Okay, I feel like I need to actually sit and recap the entirety of the episode. I know this is probably spoilers. I gotta invoke a little recap I, I just don't feel like it would make much sense to talk about it without actually explaining what's happening. Presumably after one full summer has elapsed, Billy, Zeke, and Marsha are making preparations to head back to the surface world. After being detected thanks to an overcharged energy crystal, they find themselves in the fight of their lives against robot overlords who have enslaved all other recurring creatures in subterranean Tania. Basically everyone you've come to know the previous 12 episodes gets trapped in an electric cage and roasts the shit out of Billy for A, getting them in this situation, and B, generally just being a pain in the ass. It doesn't take long for the original trio to escape, but everyone soon realizes that they may be in over their heads. It would require a real and raw attempt to crawl out of the trenches and out from under the thumb of their oppressors, which is exactly what they intend to do. I did want to take a moment to say that the actual battle montage is pretty fucking hype. I owe that mainly to the song, but the boarding and the composition certainly is not too shabby. <laughs> This is no coordinated mass, but with everyone charging it at once, it seems like they actually gave those robots hell. In the heat of victory, an evil Billy clone descends down from a giant spaceship and freezes everybody in ice, except for his twin. After a brief grapple, Billy Prime kills off evil Billy by fixing a loose screw on his head. This is real. The twin actually ended up being just like a... a ugly little grub thing, and one brief fleeting moment where everything regresses back to the heat of the pilot, and Billy delivers some divine wisdom. He kills the grub with kindness, and it brings everything back to the way it was. He wins back the crystal, he wins back their home, and the admiration of everyone that had previously hated his guts. You know, the three of them could stay for a minute, and it looks like they may do just that, but there is one last wrinkle in the plan. Welcome to Taco Shack. May I take your order? So, it's hard to articulate a proper impression of this one. I know when it premiered, it was one of the few that left a real positive impression on me in some way. Getting through the others was usually no problem, but this was a tale to get invested in. The course of the story itself is simplistic, it's only subversive in small bits, even if it doesn't make sense based on whatever dynamics were previously set up. It technically all stacks up properly in the end. Like, we both know it's a desperate situation, but with the way the beats are hit on it, all feels like it's not entirely felt. Not exactly sentimental, but genuine. One last good look around the place before we have to say goodbye. Maybe it's just me. I wouldn't say I had expectations or boxes I was looking to check off, but it wasn't an exact hit. At least not this time around. Technically, it didn't under-deliver because it did what it needed to do, for sure. But for an audience that theoretically followed these guys to the end, I'm, I'm not sure how to feel about how it sticks the landing. I will say that like many good finales, it does give its sizable cast a good role to play. It's clear that this show values its characters above all else. Even if they're not going to make the best decisions with them every time, they are the real center of the universe. 
While Billy Dilly is technically the catalyst for everything happening as it did, and thus technically was responsible for salvaging everything, he's not the true fiber or the substance of the show. I know that sounds crazy. Billy is not meant to be aspirational. You can't tell much on his being alone, and he's not the solution to everything. But rather, if everyone had something a bit more akin to Billy, anyone and everyone has the capacity to even shit out for the better. It's not exactly a totally new revelation in spirit, but it is the episode that at least brings that idea full circle. Well, that's the whole series. The entire 13 half hour series, front to back, beat for beat, episode by episode. I definitely can't say that it dazzled me every single time, but Billy Dilly is not the type of series that I would see as particularly flawed. It's hard to point to anything specific and say, ah, oh, if only they did this better. It went at its own pace, and it gave enough of itself to get its point across. It got screwed over by development and scheduling, but it's still a concrete idea that got to be its own thing. At least we think it is. It had flashes of fascination that occasionally rise to the surface, but otherwise it's a middling yet really comfy experience that shouldn't leave most people with a bad impression. You'd probably be asking why I chose to spend 40-ish minutes of your time and dozens of hours of my own trying to look at this thing that's just coming across as mid. I also know that this is unlikely to uh, resonate heavily with either side of the coin, because out of people that haven't seen it but maybe wanted to give it a shot, they would probably say, well, you know, you didn't, you didn't do a good job of hyping it up. And out of people that have seen it, they likely would say, ah, you, you just don't get it. And that's good insight. That is, that is totally fair insight to walk away with. The story of Billy Dilly as a character is pretty roundabout to me. The story of his show, a bit anticlimactic. But what either represents definitely seems more interesting. While I doubt Billy Dilly would be considered the underground wonder kind of Disney television animation if it had more visibility, I think its very brief existence did serve as a minute victory of sorts. Considering all the shit it went through to even get there, from getting snubbed and slashed in half to shit canned in a fraction of a summer, it seems like the final product itself didn't suffer as much as they typically do under certain conditions. I mean, a Springer-style show was already likely to stand out even amongst a motley crew like the Disney XD lineup. But there was just enough room and time to get it out there. 90% of the work done within the industry is stuff we never even get to see. I'm not one to give cartoons a pat on the back simply for existing. But in many ways, it's considered an anomaly if you even make it to air, let alone be as different as you want to be, or come as unadulterated as possible. These shows are always someone's first gig at all. There's always some history to uncover, and there's always something to learn. And I didn't discover any super secret Billy Dilly findings or anything, but looking back at our current landscape, I, I do have a bit more respect for it, for the atmosphere it brought to its home network for that brief, brief, brief period amount of time. Cartoons are so weird nowadays, man. There's so much happening, but not nearly as much that everyone can rally behind. I can find solace in a show that almost nobody caught on to at the time, partially because you truly get to experience it as is. There's no revisionist history or fandom discourse to examine. It just exists. Billy wasn't exactly bringing me back to the good old days or whatever, but I did relish being able to just watch it and experience it and not just watch around it if you catch my drift. These episodes represent other people's memories too. Brief flashes and vignettes of times gone by being able to breathe and exist uncut. For 13 fleeting summer days, a significant few were able to just go back in time for a little bit and see this live itself out. They likely didn't expect to reach the same heights as its contemporaries, but even at its most unassuming, it left us with an opportunity to really respond to it if we had something to say. It only has one answer to many of its own questions. Billy Dilly. Wait up, guys!